Welcome to the light. I didn't get a chance to greet our visitors here on today. We want to thank you. Uh, you're not a visitor, you're a guest. Because if this is our home, we want to make sure that you feel like it's your home as well. Amen. Amen. So we're thankful for your being here. As you're going to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6, beginning at verse 5, if you don't mind, repeat after me. Father God, Father God I'm, here I'm here today seeking a word from you. So open, so open my ears that I may hear. I may hear. Touch my heart, Touch my heart. So, that so that I will feel. And renew in me a right mind so that I will do. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. If you said that prayer, that means whatever had you upset on yesterday, uh, five minutes before you got here, whether you was in traffic and somebody didn't want to get out the way of your praise, we're going to let that go as we stand here to magnify and glorify his name. Amen. Matthew chapter 6, the gospel of Matthew chapter 6, beginning at verse 5. And these are the words of the Lord that you'll find there within the text. When you pray, you are not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they may be seen by men. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. But you, when you pray, go into the, your inner room, close your door, and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do, for they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. So do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then in this way, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Today I want to lift up this text and dealing with the topic, living with trust. Living with trust. You may be seated. Living with trust with trust. Here it is. We're in the second week of this series entitled Demonstrating a Life of Prayer, uh, where we're focusing on uh, the gospel according to Matthew chapter 6, what was come to be known as the Lord's Prayer. And what we've understood is that Jesus is teaching us within this text of how to pray. But we've come to understand that our prayer is more about what we do than what we say. On last week when we focused on verse 9 of the text, we titled that text Living with Honor. Why? Because in that text it says, pray then in this way, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Although Jesus shares these words with us that we should use these words, we know that we do not use these words every time we pray. Every time we pray, we don't go to the Lord and says, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be thy name. But behind these words are a meaning. And that meaning is that we should live a lifestyle that honors who? Our Father. That honors God as our Father, the head of our life, the giver, the taker, the Alpha, and the Omega. And we came to understand that most of our prayers seem to only go as far as their ceiling because of the simple fact that we don't truly honor God. We, uh, we came to understand that honoring God is not exhibited through our words that we say, but it's exhibited through our lifestyle, how we conduct ourselves day in and day out. And the easiest way for us to understand this was to look at God as the Father, the same way we would look at most of our fathers, if not greater. Uh, and the, f the fact of the matter is there's some things that we would do and that is outside of the presence of our Father that we would get away with. But if, we, if our father was standing right there, we would not do those things. And so we should have that same level of respect for God. Just because you don't see God every day as the way that you want to see him as you see me or an individual within your household, the fact of the matter is that God sees you always. And your lifestyle should reflect you seeing God always. When you take a step, you see God. When you get in your car, you see God. Every time that you have breathed a breath of life, you see God. So therefore, if God is with you always, then that means that God can see all things that you do. So the question is, are we living on last week? Are we living 
with honor towards God. In other words, would God be pleased with everything that we've done in our lives? And I'm not talking about the things that we've done prior to accepting Christ because we already know once we accepted Christ and asked for forgiveness, we can move on from those things. But what about the things that we have done since accepting Christ that we call us as we call ourselves a Christian and we're living our day to day life, but we're living it to please ourselves and not to honor God. We're going through life requesting things from God to benefit ourselves, but not necessarily to honor God. And so on last week, we dealt with this, this issue that we have of why our prayers may not be answered, why our prayers are not being heard, because it's impossible for God to hear our prayers because he hears the prayers of the righteous. He hears the prayers of his children those who are crying out to him. And so therefore, if the text says our father, that means that you are identifying yourself as a child of God, correct? And so therefore, if you're not a child of God, if you're not living the life that God is asking you to live, not saying that you're perfect, but if God sees in you that you are not trying to be connected with him, you're simply trying to use him, you don't deserve the right to cry out our father. God doesn't have to provide for you because of the fact that you don't want to exist within his household. You don't want to exist within his love. You don't want to exist within his compassion. You just want to use our father. And so we understood that we have to come to a point of honoring God with all of us in every aspect of our lives. But today we're going to deal with the subject of living with truth, with trust, living with trust. Now that we know how to honor God, that we need to understand that everything that we do should be about God, we want to establish how do I live and trust God? How do I live and trust God day in and day out? Yesterday we had a beautiful wedding here, uh, and I enjoy weddings. I love weddings. Uh, I was hoping Sister Ambria and Patrick Bryant would be here today so we can introduce them, but yet and still we praise God for their wedding that took place on yesterday. But nevertheless, Weddings are beautiful, but my favorite part of a marriage is the premarital counseling. And it's the premarital counseling because I get to spend seven weeks with the couple to make sure that they desire to really be married. And in those seven weeks, my only goal is to do two things. One is to build communication. Two is to establish trust. In a relationship with a lack of communication, and the lack of trust, you are destined to fail. When we're dating, we don't always communicate everything to who we're dating. Why? Because oftentimes we're not living together. Because oftentimes I don't feel like I can open up to you and share everything about me. And so therefore, there are some things that are hidden about me that you won't find out until we're married. And then once we get married, if you're anything like my wife, she'll tell you, I didn't sign up for this. You didn't tell me these things before we got married. And what it does is it places a strain on your relationship. And so then now you're busy fixing after the fact what could have been prevented before the fact. And so premarital counseling is very important to me because it deals with the understanding of a relationship, establishing communication and trust. And as we look into the text today, living with trust, verse 10, we will we'll see that now that we have honored God, we are establishing a relationship with God, and we need to make sure to establish what? Communication and trust. You'll see that within the, on the text today. What is communication? Communication, as we speak, is simply a verbal, a verbal act of exchanging words with one another to be able to express yourself, hopefully, openly, and honestly, without someone resenting you. Amen? Is that not the same thing that we do in prayer? Is not prayer based on us communicating between us and God openly and honestly with an individual that we hope will not judge us? So why is it if prayer is about us being open and honest and communicating with God, why is it that so many of us go to God and lie when we pray? 
Why is it that we go to God when we pray and we tell God all of these things that we're going to do or we will do? God, if you bail me out this last time, God, if you provide for me this time, I will give this to your house. God, if you do all of this, why do we even go to God in prayer if we're not going to communicate openly and honestly to God? The reason why we fail to communicate with openly and honestly with God is because, number one, we don't honor God. When we call on God in our desperate times of need, it's because we want something. Very few times do individuals just simply pray to give God thanks versus the prayers that I need you. It'll be more times that you pray and say, God, please provide than it is to just say, God, thank you for what you've done. What do you mean? You're saying, no, pastor, that's not me. I pray all the time. You're right. You pray when you're in that car and you're about to run out of gas. God, just, God, just let me make it to where I need to go. You didn't count that prayer, did you? You pray when you say, God, I want something to eat. Please just let there be food in my house. You forgot that prayer. God, when, when I call home and I need to talk to my mama, please just let her answer the phone. All these simple little prayers that we pray to God when we need God. But when was the last time you just prayed and told God, thank you. Thank you for what you've done. Thank you for what you're going to do. Thank you for everything that you have done in my life. It's because we are, as humans, we only see God oftentimes for what God can give us. We will ignore the fact that God is there until we need God. Because it's when we need him the most that we can say, let me communicate with you openly and honestly. You know my situations. You know my circumstances. You know what I'm going through. God, I need you right now. Now, prayer is not simply about asking God for something. Let's dispel that myth right now. Prayer is a line of communication between the father and his children. That means that every day I wake up, I should be willing to pray. Every day I step outside of my front door and the sun is still shining, I should be willing to pray. Every day that my wife loves me, I should be willing to pray because I should be able to thank God for all of these things within my life because I'm calling my daddy and saying, Daddy, you know what? You're looking out for me. And because of that, I want to just tell you thank you. But we don't see God in that manner. We see prayer as a tool that, Daddy, when I need you, I'm going to call you. And if, you, if our Father in heaven is anything like my Father on earth, I can understand why he doesn't answer the phone sometimes. I remember when I was younger, my dad used to tell me he'd go weeks without hearing from me, and I would call him. And when I'd call him, the first thing he'd say is, son, what, what do you want? I said, dad, I was just calling to check up on you. No, 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 son, what do you want? Well, dad, I need some gas money. He said, well, I got some gas money, but how are you going to come get it? Well, Dad, I got enough gas to make it there. Well, if you got enough gas to make it here, then you should have enough gas to make it work. You don't need to come get no money from me. And my dad would do that under the pretenses that you only call me when you want me, when you need me. You don't call me just to check up on me. You don't call me to look out for me. You don't call me because you love me, but you call me when you want to use me. And it wasn't until I got older that I really got an understanding of what he was really saying there because I forgot about the 18 years prior that he had taken care of me and had looked out for me without me even asking about it. And now I just willingly expected that for the rest of my life, the duration of my life, this is his responsibility. This is what he's supposed to do. This is my daddy. You owe me. The fact of the matter is my daddy didn't owe me anything. He had done and he had given me what he had owed me. And the moment that I decided to leave the house, then he had no longer owed me anything. So anything that I got from my father from that point on, I should now earn. We have to do the same thing in the eyes of God. The fact of the matter is there's nothing that we can do to really earn anything from God. But we should spend our life trying to earn whatever it is that God has to give us. Because just this moment of breath that he just gave you right now, you can't earn it. 
There's nothing that you can do to make God so happy to say, you know what, I'm going to pay you with a, a piece of breath. You can have 10 seconds of life right now. He gives to us simply because he loves us. He gives to us because there's a purpose for us. But why is not that we can't give back to God simply because we love him? Simply because we see his purpose. One of the ways that we're supposed to do that is through prayer. That's the form of us reaching out to God. But then on this communication end, there's a second aspect. Because in, in order to communicate, there's two principles. There's two persons. So we have God and then we have us. So our method of reaching out to God is what? Through prayer. But how does God communicate with us? God has two ways to communicate with us where we only have one. God communicates with us in two parts. The first part, he communicates with us through his word. The second part, he communicates with us through his spirit. And I want to make sure that we truly understand how these two components work. When God communicates with us through his word, which is the infallible truth that is left here for us to pattern our life, this is God teaching us. Oftentimes, we don't know who our father is because we don't know the things that he's taught us. He's left us a roadmap. He's given us the answers to whatever problems, whatever circumstances we can have. And God says, if you really want to talk to me, if you really want to hear my voice, I need you to read my words. I've already left everything that you need. Years of understanding, years of truth that still have power today. I've left it for you to understand and I've left it for you to read, but how can we hear God if we never open our Bibles? How can we expect to learn anything if we never read the book? The Word of God is God teaching us while we are what? Here on earth. One of the basic acronyms for Bible, I believe, stood for basic instructions before leaving earth. Basic instructions before leaving earth. I tell you all the time how my wife loves to buy things from Walmart and expects me to put them together. Brings them home and they have all these A, B, C's, D's, E, and F, one, two, threes all over the packages. And I know how alphabets go, but so I just start putting things together. She tells me every time, read the instructions. I fail to read the instructions. I can't do it. I put them together. I say, I look at the picture. This piece goes here. This piece goes there. I know what this is supposed to do. I know how it's supposed to stand. This is the base. This is the top. I can fix it. And I put it together only to allow it to last maybe a week or two, and then it begins to wobble. Why? Because I have a pocket full of screws that were extra. And I felt like they just put in a box. They knew I was going to break a screw, so they gave me an extra screw. So therefore, and then I, I get frustrated when she says, well, take it apart, send it back, and we're going to get another one. You're going to put it together again. But why should I get frustrated? Because I didn't take the time to read the instructions the first time. And so when I go back and I put it together again and then I read the instructions, it's stable. It's last forever. One, one's in our house now. It hadn't, hadn't moved. So the problem is not the product. The problem was me putting it together. Now let's flip that. God has given us instructions to live this life that we now have. He's given us instructions. He's given us the life. He's given us the instructions. He says, if you want to make it, I need you to read this. I need you to understand my words. I need you to get a comprehension. I need you to grow in this. And we decide, you know what, God? I see the product. I see what you've made. I know what you want me to be. I don't need to read this. I know what you want. You want me to prosper. You want me to be happy. You want me to be married. You want me to be faithful. You want me... You I know what you want, God. I don't, I don't need to read this. And we don't read his word, and what happens? Our life is shambles. And the first thing that we want to do is accuse God. God, why am I going through this? God, why is my life? Did you read the instructions? I, I told you how to overcome this obstacle that you're going to go through. I told you how you should find your man. I told you how you should pray. I told you how you should fast. Do you want to understand why the things that you're doing are not working? Because you know... Yeah, you know the product. You know what it looks like. But you don't know how to put it together. You don't know how to utilize it. You got a bunch of extra screws missing. Because of the fact you don't want to take the time and read my word. 
People think God doesn't answer them when they pray. The problem is, God doesn't always speak to you how you want him to speak to you. There's been some times that I prayed in my life looking for an answer from God, and I just decided to pick up the Bible and open it. And when I open it, it just happens to find out, fall right to what I need God to say. It's an understanding that is right in his word. God doesn't have to audibly speak to you day in and day out. He doesn't have to open the clouds and say, look, I got a word for you. This is what I need you to do. He doesn't have to send you the sign the way that you want to send the sign because you hadn't even taken advantage of what he's already left you. The reason he's not giving you nothing extra because you ain't asking nothing new. You're asking the same thing that is already in his word. So we have to get an understanding that we pray through, we communicate through prayer, but God communicates phase one through his word. The second part that God communicates is through his spirit. Because once we accept Christ, his spirit dwells within us. The Holy Spirit dwells within us. Now you're saying, okay, the Holy Spirit is with me. The Holy Spirit is my conscience. It whispers to me. It talks to me occasionally. But you know, the Holy Spirit don't always tell you exactly what to do. Sometimes in my life, my wife will tell you, and I pick up a quarter, and I say, God, I'm so confused. I don't know what to do. Let me get this quarter. God, if you want me to do it, let it land on heads. If you don't want me to do it, let it land on tails. And it lands on tails, but my spirit wanted to do it. And I'm saying, God, you, that's not you speaking through this coin. You're not speaking through this coin. Two out of three, Lord. Let me flip it. We're steady looking for answers from God, the answers that we want. But yet and still, if he's already taught us in our word, that's what he's shown. He's taught us in the word. Guess what he does with the Holy Spirit? He convicts us. So the word teaches us. The Holy Spirit convicts us. What does that mean? Conviction means when you think about doing wrong, when you think that you want to do something, that out of the will of God, the Holy Spirit will say, hey, you might want to think about this. You might want to change your perspective on how you're looking at this. And then that's that moment that we pause in our circumstances, our situation, and we, we start weighing things out. And then we look at, okay, well, if I do it God's way, I'm not going to get what I want right now, but I might pay off later on. But if I do it my way, I can get what I want right now, and then I can just go pray to God, and he'll forgive me for whatever I had to do to get what I It don't work like that. It don't work like that. The Holy Spirit convicts you because living as a Christian ain't easy. It won't be easy. Just yesterday, we had our men's fellowship, and the one thing that we talked about was integrity. And integrity and understanding the aspect of integrity was understanding that, you know what, integrity is about us doing what's right when nobody even sees us. Integrity is not about what you do what's right in front of other people. Integrity means when nobody is looking, am I doing what I'm supposed to do? Will I own up to my wrong when nobody even knows that I've done wrong? This is the same thing when the Holy Spirit convicts us. When we hear the voice of God speaking through us, through his word, through his spirit, and we say, you know what, I'm going to do what I want to do anyway, you have lost all aspects of integrity. You have taken God, looked him in the face, and said, you know what, I don't want to do what you want me to do. So if you can look at your father, who you're supposed to honor, and say, I don't want to do what you want me to do, then why do you still expect your father to provide to you? Why do you ex still expect God to hear your prayers? When you've willfully said, God, I don't want to follow you. It's not God taking his blessing away from you. It's you saying, God, I don't need your blessing. When we operate in our lives, we are operating our prayer. We are living our prayer. What you say for a moment matters nothing. Well, how do we know that it matters nothing? Because it says in the Bible, verse 8, so do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you what? Ask him. He's telling you don't be like the hypocrites. Don't just say things and not really do it. He's telling you don't be like the Pharisees and the scribes and just mumbling words for, with meaningless repetition, thinking that God is going to understand or care about how big your $10 words is that you're sharing with God. You don't care how discombobulated you want somebody to be. Doesn't matter what you say. Because he says in verse 8, what? I know your heart. 
How does God already know my heart and know what I need before I even ask him? It's because he is observing the lifestyle that I live, which is my prayer. Living the prayer. Am I living to honor God? And if I'm living to honor God, he can see when things are tough and this is my child. He's living for me. I got my eye on him. Do I really trust God? What does this mean? When I'm alone and I feel like I should have a companion, am I really trusting God to provide me what I need and a companion when he needs it? Or am I going to try to do it my way and get what I want when I want it? When my finances are tight and I've trusted God by giving my tithes and giving my offering, knowing that my light bill and my water bills are still due, am I really trusting God and I'm going to give what I, what I owe to God, what I promise to God? Or am I going to hold on to it to try to make ends meet? If you begin to look at your life and the things that you do, you can begin to question how much you truly trust God. You can begin to say, you know what, God, do I really trust you? Just take the five most important things to you in your life and see, on the other hand, how have I taken these five things that are important and trusted them and entrusted them to God? If my finances are important to me, how have I trusted God with my finances? If my relationship is important to me, how have I trusted God with my relationship? If my children are important to me, how have I trusted God with my children? If my home life is important to me, how have I trusted God with my home? If my job is important to me, how have I trusted God with my job? And I can bet you, because I've done it, and when I sit back, I question and say, you know what? God, I really hadn't trusted you. I'm saying it, I'm being like those Pharisees and scribes, just saying things, but I really haven't trusted you. God had to convict me myself when I was like, God, why is the church not growing the way that I think it should grow? And I had to remind myself that you know what, Chris? It's because you hadn't trusted God like you're supposed to trust God. You've gotten what God has promised you And now that you've gotten it, you feel like you can do it on your own. And so what has to happen now is I have to take a step back and begin to focus on God. God, tell me who to talk to. Show me who you want me to be with. Send the people who you'll have to be a part of this team to help this church grow. Why? You can't pay no one enough to be a member of your church. Doesn't matter how much you put them on a pedestal. They will let you down time after time after time if they are not the ones that God has sent here for you. Members don't have to be paid. Members come to what? Worship. So if I want to trust God for this church to grow, it's not going to grow by how many people I put on payroll. There's 100 seats out there. There's no way I can pay 100 people to come to church on Sunday morning. I wouldn't pay 100 people to come to church on Sunday morning. So in order for this room to be filled, I have to what? Trust God. That's it. I have to take what's important to me and stop begging and asking God, God, please provide, send this, God, send this. And God is just saying, I will if you trust me. But you're obviously not trusting me. Why? Because every day you're second guessing me. You're second guessing what I've told you to do. You're second guessing what I've already shown you works. And you're second guessing because you're acting like a spoiled brat. You're not getting what you want when you want. What good is it for God to send a room full of people if we're not prepared to leave them? It does no good. So God is saying, fix what I'm telling you to fix first. And then guess what? I'll give you what you need. I'm not going to give you what you want because right now, me wanting a room full of people is what? Me wanting it. But once we establish that solid foundation, then God can say, now you need it. He can turn your want into a need. Why? Why does it become a need? When it's a want, it's all about you. But when it's a need, it glorifies him. And so when this, just use me for a situation. If I want a room full of people right now, it could be all about me because I want it. I want to have a church full. I want to put it on video cameras. This is what it is. 
But when God says, Christopher, when you finally got your mind right, I'm going to give you what you need because now I know that your mind is right and you are leading the people. I'm going to give you what you need because now every leader needs what? People. A leader is not a leader if there's no one to follow. So now he's going to say that very want that you want, I'm going to make it a need. Let's flip it around on you now. You're looking for that husband you want to get married. You want that man in your life. Why? Because you're tired of being lonely. You're tired of going around friends. You're tired of being the third wheel. It's a want. It's all about you. But God is saying, let me, let me turn that into a need. How can God turn my relationship into a need, you ask? God can turn my relationship into a need because of the fact of the matter is now that you have become whole as my child, now that you have accepted me as your Lord and Savior and your life is right, you fix the things on the inside of you, now I can give you what you need because the Bible says it's not good for man to be alone. And if it's not good for man to be alone, guess what? It's not good for woman to be alone either. So therefore, now that you are who I created you to be, I can give you what you need. Some of us may be having problems on our jobs and sitting here saying, God, I, I want a new job. I want more money. It's still a want right now. It's not a need until you say, God, you know what? I'm thankful for what I have. I'm thankful what I'm able to do. I'm going to be a good steward with what I have and give to you what I'm supposed to give to you. But God, I would love to give more. I would love to be a part of something greater. I would love to be in a position that allows me to share your word even more. And when you're able to do that, then you have turned this want into a need. Because God, in order for me to, I'm going to do the best I can do right now with what I have. But if I want to do more, God, I need to be in a better position. If you want me to do more, I can do it, be in a better position. God doesn't provide or elevate us for us. It doesn't happen that way. If you're praying that prayer, stop. If you're asking God for something because it's what you want, you want a new car because it's what you want, stop. Be satisfied with what you got. God elevates you. He provides for you. Because through you, people should see him. Meaning he don't need to give you a new car so you can put 24s or whatever on it and just so you can showboat if it's not giving him the glory. But if you're going to use that car for whatever purpose, if you find somebody that needs to ride to church or whatever and you're saying, God, I just don't want to drive nobody in my bucket because it might break down. But Lord, I want to be committed to use whatever I have to, to help you. I've got a friend I want to help make it to work, whatever it is. Whatever the purpose is that God has laid within your heart, then God can see, you know what, you need this because you're trying to use this so that people can what? See me. When God teaches us through his word and he convicts us with his spirit, guess what happens? Teaching plus conviction equals guidance. Teaching plus conviction equals guidance. When we pray, we should pray seeking guidance. Guidance, not things, but we should pray seeking guidance. And that means if we're praying seeking guidance, then we should always end our prayer with going back to the teaching, which is the word of God, and living a lifestyle that allows conviction, which is God dwelling within us, so that what? We can receive guidance. You don't have to be like me and reach in your pocket and try to find a quarter or a dime and flip it and say, God, I need you to speak to me through this coin. If you want to talk to me, Lord, let me see a three on the back of a license plate right now. You don't need to find all these knickknacks and tricks to let God speak to you. God can guide you if you root yourself in his teaching and exist in his conviction. Meaning that you have to allow God to tell you what's wrong with you. And when he tells you what's wrong with you, you have to be willing to fix it. And if God's going to tell you what's wrong with you and you're going to be willing to fix it, means that you have to spend some time with God in his word. Teaching plus conviction equals guidance. Now that we've understood how this communication, because we remember a relationship is established on two things, communication and trust. We understand that we communicate through God, to God through what? Prayer. It's us reaching out and talking to God. Where God communicates with us through how? Teaching through his word and conviction through his spirit. So we got this communication point down. Let's look at trust. What is trust? How do we trust God? 
In order for trust to function within a relationship, it requires two things. It requires a receiver and a giver. In order for me to trust Brother Newhouse, I have to, I have to be willing to trust him, and he has to be willing to give me trust, right? Earn trust. So here it is. We have a receiver and a giver, but there's two things that a receiver should desire from the giver. These things are, one, I need to know who you are. As the receiver, the individual that's trusting you, I need to know who you are. As the giver, I mean, as the receiver, the second thing that I need is I need to know what you can do. I need to know what you can do. I need to know who you are and what can you do. Okay, Pastor Chris, you're just making stuff off the top of your head. Okay, I can show you in the text. Verse 10. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I need to know who you are. Your kingdom come. Jesus is showing us in the text after honoring him in verse 9 that we should be able to trust God because we should know who God is. How do we know who God is? Because the text showed us your kingdom comes. If we see God as our heavenly father, then we know where he reigns. We know that he has dominion over heaven and earth. And therefore, we can identify who God is. And we've already understand that our identifying ability to identify who God is is stronger now. Why? Because we have established communication with God. We know who God is because he has taught us through his word. His spirit dwells within us. And we pray not just for what we want, but we just communicate with God. We tell him what the good times. We tell him about the bad times. Just like we pick up that phone and text and talk to our friends, we should do the same to God. Every time you tell Facebook what's going on in your life and they can't do nothing about it, you should do the same with God. That should be our communication. So now that we're communicating with God on a regular basis, as Christians now, we know who God is. Oftentimes, we can't move forward in our prayer to God because we don't know God. We know of God, but God has not had a personal effect on our life that we identify with ourselves. As that song said, deliverer, provider. We don't see God as those things. And so therefore, if we don't see God as those things, if we can identify who God is to us, how can we expect God to provide? How can we expect... <laughs>